Hello, I am Mary Mason, president of the Friends of Old Dover. The Dover Days Committee, along with the Friends of Old Dover, also known as the Historical Society of Dover, are pleased to offer you a virtual celebration of our city's heritage. Dover Days began in 1933 by Mabel Lloyd Ridgely as a day with the story houses and gardens of old Dover. Through the years, the Dover Days has grown into a lively festival with parades, maypole dancing, historic reenactions, community speakers, and food and craft vendors organized by the Dover Days Committee. Due to the ongoing restrictions of the COVID pandemic, we will celebrate again this year with a series of online lectures on topics such as pre-colonial history, Victorian architecture, religion, ethnic groups, education, horticulture, and social history of Dover. We are proud of our traditions and our focus is on preserving Dover's historic and architectural heritage for future generations. We hope you enjoy our online program. The Dover Days Committee and the Friends of Old Dover look forward to spending Dover Days with you in person the way it used to be next year. A special thank you goes to the students at the R A R V E D Audio Radio Video Engineering Design of Caesar Rodney High School for their assistance with this program. Hi, my name is Nancy Quinn, and I'm going to present a, a brief history of Christ Episcopal Church in Dover, Delaware, uh, from 1703 to 1934. In 1703, uh, Kent County residents had asked the uh, Church of England for a religious leader, and they sent Reverend Thomas Crawford in 1704. So they needed a place to worship, and Re uh, Colonel Robert French of Newcastle donated a glebe farm of about 100 acres uh, on the St. Jones River, just southeast of Dover. Uh, which is probably where the, uh, the area of the DMV is, where that is now. Uh, they built a wooden church and used that for about 25 years, and it was known as the Church of Dover 100 and also St. John's Chapel. It wasn't until 1744 that uh, the Christ Church reference was made in a deed to Reverend Arthur Usher, who was uh, the pastor at that time. In 1717, uh, William Penn surveyors uh, laid out the city of Dover and uh, included two religious squares, one for the Presbyterians and one for the Church of England. So by the time uh, Reverend Frazier got here in 1733, the congregation had been collecting money to build a new brick church. And the old church, the wooden church, uh, wasn't, uh, they weren't able to repair it. So the building was begun in 1734 and it was the shape of a, a, a rectangle, a simple rectangle meeting house design. And the first entrance was here uh, in the center of the south wall where this window is. The exterior was uh, built with a Flemish bond design. You can see the black end of the brick and then the terracotta and then the black and the side of the terracotta and so on. Uh, here are some diagrams of the early church. Uh, the door originally was on this south side. Uh, this line indicates the edge of the gallery area, which was above the church or a bal balcony as we call it today. The pulpit was directly across the altar on the east wall. Uh, the stairwell here uh, went up, up to the gallery and at the beginning it was most likely that that was um, outdoors until they built this uh, small vestry building uh, which was an add-on in 1740. So it had a little access door into the church, but it was mostly separated from, from the church itself. So during the colonial period, uh, the gifts were left to the church, uh, mostly uh, to help with the building. And uh, in 1748, C Captain Benson died in, in Dover and he left uh, some things for the church, including uh, a hat band and gloves for the parson and a pair of gloves for the clerk. He also stipulated in his will that he didn't want anybody drinking at his funeral. So maybe that had been a practice and he didn't want any part of that. <laughs> in 
Captain Benson, uh, his stone is now embedded in a cedar tree, as you can see it here. It's, it's made of brownstone. It is the oldest marked grave in our, in our cemetery. Another gift was this uh, 1701 lectern Bible given to the church by Benjamin Wynn Coop in honor of his mother when she died in 17, about 1767. Um, and it is now in the Delaware archives and we had to go hunting for it to find it. So you can see the front pages and this is the outside cover here. Uh, Wincoop was a merchant and he uh, eventually moved from Sussex uh, County to Philadelphia and um, took Absalom Jones with him. Absalom Jones was a slave and he moved there to Philadelphia with Wincoop without his family. Um, he, he eventually bought his freedom and bought his family's freedom. And Absalom Jones became the first African-American priest in the Episcopal Church, and he was known uh, for his oration. Uh, he preached in the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas in Philadelphia, and um, several of our current parishioners were raised in that church, which is uh, an interesting connection. Uh, his, uh, Benjamin's mother, uh, Esther, uh, donated this colonial silver chalice and patent. Uh, she is also buried in our churchyard. And when Reverend Inglis arrived, uh, he took care of a lot of the building problems. He baptized people, he brought people into the church, and he traveled out into the community to preach and help also. Um, in 16, 1764, he married uh, Mary Vining, they ended up with uh, twin daughters, um, Mary and her daughter, one daughter died in childbirth and the other da daughter died a month later. Um, Reverend Inglis, after, uh, after that happened, he, he left, he was, he was in mourning and grieving. And so he, he left here and went to Trinity Parish in New York City where he um, had more support. He was a loyalist and uh, he was, more supported there. Uh, he eventually became, went to Canada and became uh, the Bishop of Nova Scotia. Uh, his um, the follower was Reverend Samuel McGaw. He was a protege of, of Reverend Inglis, uh, but he was uh, a sympathizer of the revolutionary cause. And eventually he moved to St. Peter's in Philadelphia. And this is his burial stone here on the left. Um, he, he liked to preach uh, politics, and so he, um, he was a real patriot and preached about it. Uh, after the revolution, he helped organize the Protestant Episcopal Church. Uh, he also uh, brought in some major gifts while he was here. Uh, you, most of these names would be familiar to everyone, including Caesar Rodney, of course. So after the revolution, you know, things were a little rocky. Uh, the building had been described as being full of moles and bats and wild boys and cattle. Uh, the Church of England, of course, was out of favor in general with, with the people and the clergy were withdrawn. Uh, they went back to England and there was no support for these new churches. Um, so the rectors didn't stay very long, sometimes not even a year. Um, but eventually uh, the vestry at Ch Christ Church and some other groups uh, got together and formed the American Church. And so our first rector, uh, Samuel Rowe, uh, be, named our church the Episcopal Congregation of Christ Church Dover. Um, and we were uh, incorporated in 1790. So the first half of the 19th century was a really depressing time for our church. There was, among other things, there was a, a fire in 1840 in the vestry room and it destroyed a lot of valuable records, which we still miss today. Uh, and it also damaged the wind coop silver. Uh, there is a story that the sexton went rushing in to, to the fire to save the silver. Uh, now Bishop uh, Alfred Lee came, he was the first Bishop of Delaware and his leadership uh, did a lot to, help, to restore our church and other churches in, in Dover. He uh, was, uh, was recorded that <clears throat> he did not want to preach at Christ Church because he had heard it was in a rueful plight full of snakes and other vermin. But about 1860, they began working uh, on the interior of the church. Money came in, people had, had um, some money they wanted to dedicate to the church. Uh, they also sold the Glebe Farm for part of this. And 
the rest of the money was used to buy the rectory across the street, which is at 502 South State Street. Uh, there are a lot of architectural elements uh, that were in favor at that time. You can see um, these arches and columns and a lot of little decorative borders around um, on, on one side of the altar, which is here, um, it was the Lord's Prayer and the other side, it was the Apostles' Creed. Those were all wallpapered onto the wall. Um, Mrs. Elizabeth Worrell paid for that, uh, but I was surprised to know that it was paper and not all painted. All the, This is all of this up here, it's just all paper. This um, odd shape here is a swag that was hanging from the balcony, by the way, it was uh, Christmas time. It gives you an odd perspective. Uh, notice that um, uh, th these were started out with clear glass windows, and this is before the chancel was added on. This picture was from a daguerreotype. So they added on this chancel, went out 15 feet from the building. Um, it was actually out into the into the cemetery, so there were some graves up, uh, underneath, which they left. Um, the, the pulpit is on the right, and there's a lectern here on the left, um, the altar back here. And this is a, a patterned uh, glass window. Um, you, there aren't any uh, pictures of humans or anything in it. It's just a pattern. It's hard to see. We don't really have a good photo of that. The floor was raised up and was constructed of wood, so there was no longer a dirt floor. Um, we don't, uh, let's see, the high pews uh, were gone. Those were those boxes that people rented. Um, so they put in these pews to accommodate more people. And some of that decorative trim is still visible, but the, a, a lot of it has, has been removed. Um, this is a, a baptismal font. We still have this font out, it's outside now. Um, it, it has bulrushes on it and a, a scripture uh, relating to Moses. Now here is, um, when, when they moved the door, this was the entrance just north of the vestry room. And it, there's a little vestibule here. Um, the south entrance was closed, of course, <clears throat> they start, as they started putting windows in. Here's a better picture of that. Now, if you go inside of there, uh, you could walk directly into the main church, into the nave, or if you turned right, you would go up the stairs that used to be outside and, and they're now in, inside and closed uh, to go up to the gallery. Here's a, a couple of uh, diagrams of that. I, I turned them in two different directions. One thing to notice uh, was that uh, this is a, an old parish house that was here in front of the church. And uh, that had got moved and then uh, removed entirely. Uh, you can see a, a flue here. There was a fireplace here that warmed the church a little bit. And there was also a fireplace here in the vestry room. Uh, this is a, the first uh, photo we have of the rood screen. Uh, you know, in uh, cathedrals in Europe, you would often see a rood screen, not as a, just a cross, but as a crucifixion. Uh, with maybe apostles uh, on either side or maybe angels. Um, the, the organ was purchased in um, 1880. You see it here. It, it, it was also moved around several places. Uh, and here's that baptismal font on the right. I'm going to talk a little bit about briefly about the windows. The, uh, this um, uh, Worrell window was um, Mrs. Worrell dedicated this to her husband and eventually to herself. She also uh, did all that decorative work, paid for that, and she also paid to have our 1876 bell and belfry built. Um, so the, this window uh, reflected the idea of uh, uh, that it uh, was not, you should not have human um, depictions in stained glass. So actually this uh, dove up here uh, representing the Holy Spirit was a kind of uh, daring thing to put in. Uh, this window is uh, dedicated to James Washington Ro uh, Robbins and it shows Jesus feeding the 5,000. Um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Robbins was uh, one of the founders of Richardson and Robbins Cannery in Dover. So the food and the cannery kind of make a connection. Uh, the Lucinda Hall Bradford window, which uh, 
replace that pattern window. Um, it was created in Germany and it uh, represents John the Baptist when he first sees Jesus and says, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So he was naming Jesus as the son of God. Um, it's a be very beautiful window also. Now the heaven window is on the, the south wall in the center where the door used to be. And you can see um, a nativity scene here and then Jesus with the children on the other side. Uh, the center of the north wall, we have this uh, Jesus with again with the children. And um, this was dedicated to Dr. Henry Ridgely, who was a pediatrician. So again, they made the connection between the children and the doctor's um, um, career. The two in the back um, are the Bonwill uh, windows. The, this first one uh, is the risen Christ and it is made, uh, created in the style of Tiffany. Uh, there are some layers of glass in it that create a little bit of distance uh, in the back by making everything a little hazy. And you can see more of this window on the outside over here in this photo than you can for the other windows. Now the Mary Magdalene window also a, a, a donated by the Bonwells uh, is on the opposite side facing the risen Christ. Uh, this is a really, this is a really beautiful window. The colors in it are just lovely. The Bonwells are buried right in front of the church. Um, they have a big monument with all their names on it. And here they are together. So you can see the style being uh, the same and the beautiful colors. This is the Christ the King church, uh, Christ the King window, excuse me. It was uh, installed in 1929 uh, by the son of Will Willard and uh, Annie Ponder Salisbury. Uh, Willard Salisbury was a chancellor. And it, um, it, 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 has, it re represents the second coming of Christ and it has zodiac signs in it and the Alpha and Omega and Christ as King and angels and so on. Now, in 1910 and to, from then to 1934, uh, Re Reverend Benjamin Fish Thompson became the rector of Christ Church. Uh, when he retired, he moved over to Elm Terrace, which is you know just across the alley from us, and he influenced a lot of renovation on the property and in the church itself. So in 1913, they began work inside. Um, notice the rude screen is now white in, instead of uh, that dark wood color that we saw before. But the main thing they did was uh, they deepened this chancel from 15 feet to 31 feet. And then on the left or north side here, there's a door and it goes into a, an addition, which was uh, a sacristy and a choir room. So that gave them a lot more space and storage space and so on. Uh, they also uh, added some, some of this paneling that you see here. Um, the organ was moved, so that was brought down uh, to this chancel area and the lighting was, re was revised and now became electric instead of gas. This was obviously Christmas time. Uh, so the woodwork was painted white and the pews had a little mahogany trim on them. Uh, the uh, walls before this were green and the ceiling was blue. So changing that to three tones of colonial yellow was really different. Uh, they took out the carpet, refinished the floors and put runners in on the aisles and put in new, cu new cushions. And this took a whole year to do. So they were out of the church for a whole year. When they came back, um, they had formed a, a Vested Boys Choir. This is a little bit later photo, but it's still, you know, the boys choir. So the bishop came, this time Bishop Kinsman, um, and had a benediction service. Uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Thompson was not finished. And in 1916, uh, his son, William Heil Thompson, who is buried in our churchyard, actually the whole family's here, um, began uh, designing uh, this wall to go around the property. And if you look at the picture on the left, uh, this was done in 1916 uh, or 17, um, this line right here was where the property ended. So they purchased the property in front so that we, we would have a State Street uh, entry. And you'll notice right across here is 502 South State Street, which is was the rectory. Um, so the 1,700 feet of wall, and a lot of it paid for 
uh, by the, uh, the DuPont family in honor of the Ridgeleys. So uh, this is the, the architectural drawing uh, going around. There was a hedge here that was uh, thorny and where there were holes, they shoved in barbed wire. Uh, so the wall was certainly a more elegant um, feature added on. <laughs> uh, this here's the Lich Gate. I, I, ha I like this photo because the 1920 and there's no curb, no brick sidewalk, uh, you know, just dirt roads. And here it is today, of course. So in 1919, they started working on the west side of the church. And this, is, this was also designed by William Pyle Thompson. Um, they removed this entrance to the church and basically and put it here at this end of what was the vestry room. So this door was removed. Um, this whole thing was bricked in. Um, the stairwell that was in here has been moved. I have a photo of that graph of that. And of course the center door was put in and there were steps put in, these steps. And they had to uh, raise the floor inside so that it would meet the height of the floor of the church. Um, here's a photograph before they started that work. Here's the, again, the door that, that was on the north side. Uh, there was a fireplace here at one time and there's this little door that went into the vestry room. Notice that the organ is in the balcony. Um, this is the stairwell. It would have gone on this wall here, but now there's a door there. So that's not, they had to move it. And here's the central doors that going inside the church and the floor that was filled up with concrete and cinders and um, tiles were added, these tiles. So 1934, 200th anniversary of the church building. Um, they had a big celebration and uh, Bishop Cook came and uh, Reverend Thompson delivered a historical paper, um, which I have a copy of that and actually, uh, some of the information in this slideshow is in, it was, came from that, that particular uh, address that he gave. Um, and the endowment fund was established at that time. So that uh, brings us up to the end of uh, this presentation. Of course, there's more, more history, but it's not here. Um, and if you want to discuss any of that with me, you can get in touch with me through Friends of Old Dover. Thank you very much.